about how many, like, how many people already saw this presentation or are here to see if I screw it up? Like, <laughs> se seriously, three, four, five people. All right. Um, so basically what happened is, like, uh, it, for those of us not in California, this DevOps thing sort of bubbled for a while. And one of the things that happens is that buzzwords bubble out of California. And if you're not there, you spend a fair amount of time ignoring them. And you develop this sort of defense strategy where you ignore it for a little while and see if it sticks around. This one, I was like, I just put it on a sort of a, woohoo! I put it on a two-year ignore strategy, and then uh, it kept around, so I decided to start paying attention to it. Um, so the, the, I think what happened was the last time at Lisa, the, I think there was some kind of like weird internal coup going on, and the people organizing the program were organizing this sort of subtle anti-Lisa Lisa program thing, and they're like, you, you're going to talk about this. I'm like, but your systems administration is in the name. It's in the name of your thing. It says large installation systems administration. And like I would just say, don't do that. And they're like, I know. Come on. It's going to be great. So I went. So this is going to be that. So this is a, a cranky call to action. So I think and hope. Uh, so uh, people who know me, and there's a couple of people here who know this, um, I purposefully overstate things for emphasis, but actually secretly I believe it. So it's like this weird layered defense strategy, kind of like irony was in the 90s and the early 2000s. Like, <laughs> like you say it, but you really mean it, but you get to pretend that you don't mean it. So I kind of really mean it all. Um, so I think that systems administration is pretty much dead. I think DevOps is a super, super helpful Band-Aid on top of that. But I think there's, there's a set of focus and there's a set of emphasis that's totally wrong in the way people talk and think about DevOps, and I'm going to talk about that. And in particular, like I think so much of what we talk about involves us doing the computer's work for them. Like, let's stop doing that. Let us stop feeding the computer with our blood and sweat and tears and time and make the computers work for a living. They're not citizens. They don't have rights. Like, we can put them to work. So we should. Um, for scoping, like, the, when I gave this talk the last time, people were like, yeah, but what about the dentist's office? Don't they need somebody to fix their printer? Yes, the dentist will need somebody to help them fix their printer. And that's true. But... It is also true that the printers are dramatically less crappy than they were five years ago. And the printers actually don't need that much fixing. And a lot of the fixing can be done by people who don't really understand what IP is or how printer discovery protocols have changed in the last two years because the ways of fixing are mostly mechanical. So I'm not going to talk about printers. So this is a uh, multiprocessing computing facility. Um, this, is this, is, this is the multi-processing computing facility in uh, Washington, D.C. They were computing social security and war benefits. Um, that had a lot of throughput, a certain amount of parallelism. Uh, there, was, uh, con there was eventual consistency, and a lot of this, uh, no, there was. There was eventual consistency. A lot of these records are actually stored at a massive, massive facility near here, a little bit north of Pittsburgh in the middle of nowhere for no good. You're just like, it's just paperwork, and they've tried to... They've tried to compute. I know this is a computer, and these are computers, but they've tried to actually properly computerize this uh, two and a half times in the last 15 years and failed utterly every single time because um, this is actually an idea that people had. We're not going to talk about machines eating. Wait, we're, gonna, we're not going to talk about machines eating people. So I think that this is a bold and surprising claim set of claims to make. Uh, I'm going to give you guys some context so you don't think I'm just a jerk. Yes, I am a jerk, but not just a jerk. So. Um, I got my start in this industry the same way, like, I know I'm old and not all of you are old, but let's pretend you're all kind of old, like me. Um, I got my start in this industry at the dawn of the internet, and I worked at a university, and then I worked in an ISP. Like, that's just what happened, right? And, like, we did everything. We did, like, you know, I was in the systems department, but we, like, you know, terminated our own cable. Why? We did it badly. Why did we do that? Because we didn't understand what near and crosstalk was, and we thought it was fine, right? And like uh, we pulled fiber and we bent it too much and broke it because we were idiots, right? And we also did a bunch of software engineering very badly, and like we probably did the systems badly too. But we did all this because none of us knew what we were doing, and it was actually pretty glorious. And I think that what was great about that environment was um, there were a bunch of really hard problems. None of those problems were already solved by someone else, and if you were good at it, there was no top. Right? So none of the network geeks were ignorant of software because the net, like, you couldn't buy a decent router. You had to build a decent router, and you had to understand something about network protocols to make it actually work properly. 
Um, and so I think that as the industry's gotten more mature, there's been a little bit more segmentation, which is really too bad. And so I think what's helpful about DevOps is the move away from that. Um, so many of you worked at this, uh, worked in these kinds of environments. I saw some like chuckling and laughing. Um, and, and I like that. But I also want, one of the things I see people do is uh, lionize or look back in, with nostalgia at these days of like, wasn't it great when? I'm like, actually, like some of it really wasn't great. Was it, wasn't it great when we had the account creation script that used expect that went out to five different unices and like the VMS boxes and the windows to create your account? Was that great? Was that great? No, that was terrible. That was awful. And you're like, why can I not log into this one machine? Oh, because that is in trusted computing base mode because it's DEC OSF and it couldn't create your account because reasons. And you're like, no, it was not great. It was terrible. OK, so, so that's context. That's where I'm coming from. Uh, you can proceed to uh, uh, interpret everything I say in the light of the fact that I'm uh, tall, pale skin, bald, and come from that background. That's what we do because we're humans. Um, so site reliability engineering. Let me tell you something. Uh, I will give you a mythical history of how we do a similar set of work at Google. And I will say that this history is not true. Uh, well, it's not literal, but it is true. Right? This isn't actually how site reliability engineering was created at Google, but this is a true story about how site reliability engineering was created at Google. And if you haven't really studied myths or history or how culture works, uh, just pretend that those conflicting sentences actually made sense. Just shove them in your brain, and they'll sort themselves out later. I would do that with most of what I say, actually. So in the beginning, Google was cheap. Google was cheap. And they were crazy ambitious. So this combination of frugality and hubris are what gave rise to the systems engineering and software engineering culture that Google has right now. So cheap means they seriously were like shaving pennies everywhere. They would look at stuff people sold and say, like, why is that so expensive? I'll bet I can do it for less, right? So there you go. Cheap plus hubris equals like do it yourself and do it in a really, really different way. This applied to hardware. Like, right from the beginning, Google was like, can't we just get cheap crap? And see, if my phone's like, you said Google. Don't you want help? I don't want help. Uh, <laughs> it's just like over there. <laughs> That's what it is. Um, if you have like a glottal stop followed by Google, it's going to be like, you said, OK. I've got to say it quietly, because it'll hear me. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so this applies to hardware. But it also applies to people. Like I remember, I, I did a bunch of like network interconnection stuff uh, before I got to Google, and like people used to hate the fact that Google doesn't have a knock, right? But how many of you worked in uh, ISPs in the '90s or early 2000s? Who worked? So did you guys have a knock, like a place where everybody sat and looked at screens? You did, because Demon was terrible, right? But no, right? You didn't, right? Anyone else who worked in ISP? See, most of us didn't because we thought about that and we're like. I'm not sure what that's for. Like, I know it's for the clients coming in. Maybe we can arrange some seats and we can sit there when you bring in people for tours. But like, what's it for? What is it for? And so like, well, there's big screens and people look at the little screens and we put other stuff up on the big, like, I don't get it. Right? So Google decided we're not going to have a knock, right? We're not going to have that. Um, there is no knock. There's just a set of monitoring. And if it goes off, things are broken. If it doesn't go off, there's not broken. There's nothing in particular to look at. And so people just sit at their desks and do whatever the hell they want to and go have lunch, right, and go take a shower if there are no alerts firing. So um, software developers ran their own code in production. This is because they didn't want to hire sysadmins, right? So they're like, well, you do it. Don't you know how to do it? And they're like, well, I kind of know how to do it, but I don't want to do it. I'm like, well, make it better so you don't care. Right? And so then that started. So this is what happened is the software developers were like, well, I don't want to run my code in production. Because it's a, like, first of all, they were like, I don't want to have to build my own code. Why is that? Well, because it's a hassle, and the builds don't always work, and there's dependencies that don't get resolved. <laughs> and they would whine, right? And they're like, we'll fix it. And they're like, fine. So the people who hated it were also the people with the best position and the skills to fix it. And so they did that. That was great. Um, and they got more stuff. They got uh, a cluster operating system with automatic task restarting and distributed debugging and distributed uh, log analysis, and it was all glorious and great. Um, one of the things that they discovered in this time period was that some of these software engineers were much more production-minded than others. Um, they had a sort of, um, they had the, the broader perspective rather than a deeper perspective, had an appreciation for how things fit together, had a certain ethos for how important it was to get things and keep things operating and working. 
and also had that sort of appropriate cranky cynicism that things were going to break and sort of understanding how they're going to break, those people became site reliability engineers. So the concise way we say this is uh, SREs are systems and software engineers who solve production problems with, so with software. So our organizational structure turns out to be fairly important. We are not, we are a separate organization. I think this is interesting. You guys have talked a lot about organizational and culture issues. SRE is a separate organization within Google. We have individual teams that engage with uh, combinations of software engineering teams, but we are outsiders, right? So we come in and work with a team on their service to make it work better. This turns out to be really, really effective for us, and it's something I think more people should consider. In particular, I think if you took a development team and divided it into one third, two thirds, and told a third of them, you report to a different manager, you're working on the same project, but your job is to make it work better rather than ship features. If you just did that, you would get 90% of the benefit of, of SRE as an approach. Because they come in and they would say like, why is there one of these? I don't know, because I wanted one. But if it goes down, what else breaks? This other stuff. That seems bad, can we have two of them? I guess you could, but it'd be a little bit complicated. Let me help you do that, right? And just iterate through that. Just ask these, ask these fairly basic questions like, what happens if it's Tuesday and Frank's not here? Well, if his workstation is down, the monitoring won't work for this thing. <laughs> OK. Is Frank going to be here on Tuesday? Actually, no, no. I think his kid has a play at school. OK, let's do something about Frank's workstation, right? And so on. So. So what about DevOps, right? Like, isn't, so one of the questions I think a lot of people ask, so let me just get this on the table. I think site reliability engineering is one of the dumber names, uh, and Ben Trainer's my boss's boss's boss or something, and he made up the term, so I probably just got fired, which is awesome, because we can just give the rest of the talk. So um, I just think it's a, it's a weird, confusing name. It sounds like facilities work, or it sounds like electrical engineering work. It doesn't make sense, but the industry's kind of gone with it, so we'll go with it. But DevOps sounds pretty cool, and isn't DevOps just SRE? Here's what I want to say about that. I think that DevOps values and reifies, you're not supposed to use words like reifies in technical talks, but I'm going to go ahead and do it, and you guys can like pillory me later for that. See, I worked pillory in there, too. That was good. Um, I think DevOps makes central and boosts the character of operations in a way that I think is short-term fine, but long-term deeply problematic. Like, I think we as an industry and we as a set of professionals who are systems and software engineers who care about the way things work need to think super critically about doing everything we can to eliminate operations as a genre of work, as a professional aspiration, as a set of things we should aspire to and care about. Um, and so that's really what I'm trying to talk about. I think DevOps looks at organizational issue and roles of organizations in a super useful way. So, you know, you guys have seen pictures about this. I think this is this kind of stuff and the organizational and cultural stuff that people have talked about with respect to DevOps. That's the core of the value of it. And that's what's absolutely useful and fascinating and interesting, right? The idea that um, you would have an organization, a technical organization with software engineers, uh, working with people who care about security, working with people who understand and care about the availability and reliability of services in production, working with people who care about you know, uh, customer-facing issues as well. Like All of that integrated together, that's fantastic. That's rad, right? Um, but what's not rad is this idea that operations is a central component. It's not just central to the name. It's central to how people talk about doing this. And so often what that means is that we undershoot. We undersell ourselves. So instead of saying, like, how do we automate the pushes, we should be saying, like, how do we eliminate the very idea of a push? Instead of saying, like, how can I make it easier to reboot the servers, you should say, why do I care that there are servers? Right? And I don't just mean that for like, some uh, infrastructure ignorant uh, developer who you're trying to hide all the details from, because I know people do that, but I mean for people who understand how the infrastructure works. Like, it's possible to build infrastructure where you very occasionally need to know that there's a server and need to know what ports the server's listening on and how to log into it and how to fix some problems. But if it gets to that point, it's a very, very serious set of a number of things that have gone wrong in sequence, and you're going to be writing a detailed postmortem to understand that. And I think most of the infrastructure that I'm lucky enough to get to work on at Google is like that. Like, nobody logs into a machine unless something's gone disastrously wrong, and you do have to write a postmortem. If you know, like, 
if you know the name of an individual machine and like have to do something with respect to that name, it's a catastrophically terrible problem in most cases. And you really need to figure out how you got that way. And you do get that way. And you need to maintain your knowledge about that, but you shouldn't expect that to be a daily part of how you do things. And I think most of what, I think a lot of what we do is we're, we're in a bad circumstance. Like everything's so much better than it was, we get excited. This is like the, okay, so this is like the air in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is beautiful. Pittsburgh also has the worst air in the United States. It's terrible, right? And it's, it's so much better than it was that when you talk to people who grew up here, they're like, what are you talking about? It's so awesome. I'm like, the fact that it is, the fact that you can walk outside and not have to have a change of clothes at work to put on when you get to work because your clothes are covered in coal, that is fantastic. That is so much better. Right? The fact that your house has a shower in the basement that you don't have to use when you come home anymore, that is great. Like, no, I'm not kidding. Like, every house in Pittsburgh has a shower. Back me up, somebody who's from here. You've got a shower in the basement, right? Like, why is there a shower in your basement? Because there was coal in the air, and you would walk through it and be covered in it, right? So it's not that. That's great. But you know what? We're not done. And I think the same thing is true about where we are. Things were horrible and kludgy and dumb, and now they're pretty substantially less horrible in Kluge and Dumb, and that's great, but let's not undershoot where we could get to. So, I think when we look at what I'm interested in preserving here, and I'll go fast through the last part, I think, um, I don't wanna preserve operations because I think operations has, in its core, the set of repetitive behaviors that are reinforcing to a lot of people like us, and I think they're actually dangerous in the same way that like Candy Crush is dangerous. It's actually probably worse than Candy Crush. No, seriously, so like, so I, I generally don't like people, but for some reason I like helping people. Like, I don't like you guys in particular, but I really don't like people, but I like helping people. So if you come to me and you're like, hey, can you help me with this thing? And it's a futsy thing, so I futz and I help you. And you're like, oh my God, that was so great. It was so helpful. And you go tell your boss and your coworkers, like, that time guy, he really helped me out. Right, so then they come to me and they're like, hey, can you help me with this thing? And I do some futzy thing. And I'm, so now I'm in a feedback loop, right? I'm doing futzy things. And what I really need to do is tell all y'all to go, I'll screw off, and I'm gonna go over here and automate this nonsense that you're asking me to do so that not only do you not have to ask me to do it, you don't have to think about it either. It just happens, right? But in order to do that, I need to go set aside some time to go think about that. And it is useful for me to have suffered through the process to really understand it. Like, we don't want to automate dumb stuff, and we don't want to build infrastructure that doesn't work in the ways we need to expect it. But we also really, really, really don't want to get caught in these feedback loops. And I think operations is a lot about that. Um, on the other hand, I think that there is a culture where a lot of us come from of taking production seriously that is crazy beneficial and important. And we've all worked with people who don't take production seriously. Like, it's down. Like, the site is down. Like, the database is not working. The data are corrupt. The transactions are not being processed. And there's, like, the attitude of, like, huh, okay, that's interesting. I wonder who's going to fix that. And there's, the, like, let's figure it out. Like, not, I'm not talking about freaking out. I'm not talking about getting all excited about it. I'm just saying, like, I take this seriously. I'm going to get on this. We are going to figure this out, and we're going to stay on it because it's important and because I take production seriously. So that's the set of things that I want to preserve from this culture of operations as we go forward into eliminating the notion of operations. So fast, careful, troubleshooting, an ethic of caring. Um, I think this end-to-end -end understanding of the system. Many, many people in this industry love to go deep on a tiny little sliver of something, and you ask some other question that you think is like technologically, functionally, even contextually adjacent to the thing they're doing. They're like, I don't know about that. Like, I don't know. Like, there's a lot of developers who are really, really successful developers who if you say like, like anything about POSIX file system semantics or anything about like opening a network socket, they're like, I don't know about that. I use Java. You're like, it's, it's like not what? Like, or there's a lot of systems guys who say like, well, let's think about the way that works on the network and let's think about like, you know, let's think about uh, packet per second rate or let's think about the way we encapsulate that or serialize or unserialize that on the network. And they're like, I'm a systems guy. I don't do network. Like, what? The network's just another set of systems, and the system's just a piece of the network. Like, so I think that the, the understanding of the integration of end-to-end -end we've got to preserve. So Google's approach to this, uh, I'll mention pretty briefly, but um, 
I mentioned this mostly in the form of trying to think about where the jobs are going to go and where the interesting work is going to go. So platforms. Like, I think there's going to be people building interesting hardware. I think there's going to be interesting, fascinating data center work. Like, there were a couple of us who are data center geeks here who were, like, geeking out on data center stuff. That was cool. Um, and I think that's going to continue. I think there's amazing power engineering to be done. So anyone who's interested in that, there's going to be tons of work there. Yep, see? Awesome. Right? I think that there is going to be a ton of infrastructure software engineering. Because if you want to get rid of operate, the, there's like the, the, the non-way, the half-assed way, and the fully-assed way of getting rid of operations. So the non-way is roughly what we're doing now, which is we kind of do it mostly manually, and occasionally we write a shell script that we have to debug every single time we run it. So that's, that's right? People are laughing because you know that you've done that, right? Um, we've all done that. So there's that. And then there's the like half-assed way, which is we write pretty decent automation. And we're kind of, a, we're kind of segueing into that, and that's good. The fully asked way is to write infrastructure that doesn't require that kind of procedural automation. And that's really where we need, in order to get to that point, we need to have a better understanding of what we're doing. We need to have a better understanding of what our requirements are. I think Google's cluster operating system approach is one useful approach to that. Um, it is not something that uh, people have loved in the industry. People are confused about whether they want VMs or whether they're willing to take tasks and jobs and whether they're willing to stop thinking about processes on Unix boxes. And I think we're going to have this conversation for a number of years. I think a VM is a useful abstraction, but it's a pretty heavyweight one. And I think we're going to have to think about that. So uh, I think on this, I think the platform's work is going to get bimodal. I think there's going to be a small number of really, really skilled engineers working on data center platforms, hardware stuff uh, that are what we all work on. And they're going to be good at their jobs. They're going to be way smarter than me. And I'm going to love what they do, but I'm not going to be able to get a job doing that. There's going to be a larger number of crazy unskilled people who really don't require sophisticated troubleshooting who will run data centers. They will replace machines and replace switches and run cable. And they will be sort of semi-skilled. And there's going to be a lot of that work. But that's not the work that most of us really aspire to. Um, I think infrastructure software engineering, if you're really, really good, there's going to be a lot of this. Uh, and if you're not really, really good, uh, you're going to get squeezed out of this. And then for systems administration, I think this is the middle that gets squeezed. Like People who don't have good software skills, who aren't building infrastructure software, who aren't working on platforms, uh, who aren't building applications, like this is the middle that will be eliminated um, and I think it should be eliminated, uh, and not just because, not just because, like I think that would be a better world, but because I think we are worthy of more interesting work than that. Like I think this is not worthy of us. So, there's a picture. There you go. There's another picture. Look at where there's two pictures of the same picture. That's kind of weird. Oh, there's another picture. This one's got color on it. Like I don't know. I threw these in here to distract you from everything I said before. Um, that was pretty good. Uh, so uh, closing in on it here. So I, you know, I think that we, as I said, I think we need to divide babies in bathwater. This is this English language, right? This is like you throw out a baby in the bathwater. Anyway, like, so I think we should save, like, wait, do you save the baby or you save? No, you save the bathwater. What do you do? Did I get this right? Oh, yeah, OK, I got it right. I like babies, but I just am not, I couldn't remember the, the phrase. You save the bathtub as well. I got a claw foot, like big cast iron. I'm just trying to picture picking it up and throwing a baby out with it. Um, so, I, like as I mentioned, like I think there's a whole set of things from this culture of operations that we absolutely should be saving. Um, and I listed a bunch here, and I already went through them. Like I'm not trying to eliminate what's impressive and characteristic and awesome about that. And I think that of the people that I know that I've worked with, the two things that stand out the most are the end-to-end -end understanding of systems and the ethic about the importance of production. Those are things that are very difficult to teach to people, and those are things that like I value enormously in my coworkers, and you guys probably do too. Um, but I think there's a whole set of other things. I didn't even touch on this in a much longer version of the talk. I'll say, like, I think configuration management is going to eat us alive. Like, I think we, we have traded OS management, which was horrible, for configuration management, which has the possibility of being dramatically more horrible because it's an even less constrained space. And so I'm going to tell you this, and then like five years from now, you're going to say, like, how do I have 145,000 lines of configuration to deploy this service? And I'm like, that guy said that this was going to happen. 145,000 lines. 
that is how much configuration you're going to have if we don't figure this out, because it's really not good. And I'll note that I put heroism on there before I saw the talk, before I saw the talk. We, at, like, got to get rid of that. Like, that's just useless. It's terrible. <laughs> it's terrible. And it's not just terrible because it's inhumane, but it's terrible because people do bad work. I don't like working with heroes. Like, it makes my life worse. It makes the services work less well. So here's the TLDR. The industry moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around, you might miss it. So I've got, like, there was, oh, I eliminated. I had Hegel and Ferris Bueller, and I also had uh, Hitchhiker's Guide in the same presentation, but I think I got rid of Hegel, so I don't know what to tell you. Um, I think uh, operations tasks should be going away. I think sysadmins should significantly improve their software skills. And let me make this specific pitch. Um, I feel this way, so a lot of you have a systems or a network engineering background feel this way. Because you are smart, you think you're not good software engineers because you have worked with some great software engineers. But let me tell you, like, most of the systems engineers I know who think they're not developers are better than 95% of the developers I know who think they are developers. So <laughs> I strongly suggest that you just get over it. It's just software, like code more. Everything is code. Software is going to eat the world. And like you guys can all code. Every one of you can figure out how to code. Like My kids can figure out how to code. You can figure out how to code, too. You don't have to be the most sophisticated algorithmic software engineer to be able to successfully write a lot of very good software. Uh, so that's all I got. What do you guys got? Questions? Seriously, no tomatoes. This is a kitten. It's a kitten. Just to distract. Yeah. Yeah, sorry about the Cleveland thing. I really feel bad here. It's okay. We're drowning in it. We're drowning. I saw a uh, small service, I won't say which, uh, but it's a small service. It has like uh, <clears throat> three or four front ends with like maybe 15 methods on it, uh, accesses like some logic, and then gets some data from a store and serves it back to a user. 15,000 lines of configuration to deploy that. Um, 15,000 lines. And that's pretty normal. So um, yeah, I think that we, we have not solved this problem. Uh, I think we are working hard at it. I think that the core of the problem is um, twofold. One is I think we should cut ourselves some slack because it is true that the distributed configuration that we are all doing now is big. It is also true that the infrastructure we're deploying is much, much, much bigger than it used to be. So we need to step back and be like, OK, so configuration has exploded by 10x, 20x. Infrastructure has exploded by 1,000 to 10,000x. So, we're doing sublinear explosion, but the future's still going to eat us. So, OK, OK, so like, it's not terrible. It's just, no, it's terrible, but it's not catastrophically terrible yet. But I, like, I think that we, there's a lot of people working really hard on intent-based configuration. There's a lot of people, like, so if you need, like, everybody's like, you know what we need is a templating system. <laughs> How many people have written a templating system? How many people have written two templating systems? How many people have written four templates? Like, it's just, you're like, you know, what I, you know what I didn't like about my last templating system? I'm going to do in this one, right? And then I'll port everything to it. Didn't I do good work? I'm like, I, I don't know. I, like, it's still, you deploy your service. It still just kind of works. But man, you did a lot of work. So I don't know. I think um, I have a lot of hope that intent-based configuration will be good. I think that the single thing that I worry about is that the operating system configuration space was helpfully constrained. And I know we all found that frustrating, but you couldn't just slap any crap anywhere in Etsy and hope for the best, right? Like, you actually needed to know roughly the set of things that were running, where they expected a set of files to be laid out, right? This was nice. It kind of boxed you into an unhelpful corner that constrained how much configuration complexity you can generate. And now we're like, 
services. It'll all be great. And so, I don't know. Intent-based configuration and hope and pixie dust. Those are my three answers. I'm sticking to it. Uh, explicitly, anyone who's bored can just leave. Uh, I don't mind. It is late. Who else has questions? Any other? Yes? Could everyone hear that question? The question is, uh, dinosaur environments, when will they go away? Film at 11, is that fair? Right? <clears throat> so um, here, here's my anecdote about that. You know how cloud is really important, but none of us who actually work in technology know what cloud is? You know that thing? You're like, <laughs> right? So cloud is actually the answer to this. So it took me a long time. I was like, I don't know. like. You keep using this word, and I read about it, and I'm like, but that's just what we do. I don't, what do you, like, I don't understand what this is about. That's what we've always done. What? But so it took me a while to figure out, like, cloud is what enterprises do when they're going to stop doing things the way they were doing things before and start doing things more the way that a lot of us have always been doing things. And so I'm like, that's great. That, that, for me, that was a super helpful frame of like, it's not something totally new. It's actually a way of framing a set of APIs and services that we just consider sort of reasonable to people who did not consider those reasonable. So, but what's happening now is that by virtue of pretty massive success of AWS and pretty massive success of some of the private cloud providers, I think a lot of dinosaur places are like, wait, that's not a joke. That actually does work. And as that starts to happen, as that starts to change, I think a lot of people, that there will be a sea change in IT. Right? But I think it's going to be terribly, terribly slow in coming. So um, it, change is happening. Change will happen because of the cloud. The cloud is actually the answer to everything. Yeah. Yes, cloud. I got cloud in there. Anything else? Yes? Well, so. Tell me more about, like, there's a premise behind your question that, like, you think we don't hire systems engineers who... Yeah, so, so in a, yeah, so let me just uh, try that, and then uh, you can uh, snark at me and tell me that I'm a liar. Um, so, the, so in SRE, we have two job ladders because it's a big corporation and they have job ladders. I didn't even know what a job ladder was. The largest company I worked for before I worked for Google had 45 employees, and I was like, this is like that, but 45,000, it's the same thing. Um, so we have two job ladders, and one of them is the systems engineering job ladder, and the other is the software engineering job ladder. The software engineering job ladder, sweet SRE, it's like you're a software engineer at Google. You got to have like awesome algorithmic sophistication. You have, have really fluent coding in a number of good languages. Fantastic. You're going to be a great Google general software engineer, but we look for some other stuff as well. But if you don't like SRE and we hire you as a software engineer in SRE, you could just transfer to any software engineering team. So we ensure that your software skills are up to sort of the Google standard of software engineering skills. The systems engineering side, you have to have excellent, what I think most in the industry consider excellent software engineering skills, but we really, we don't expect it, that to always be like super algorithmically sophisticated. So if we're like, uh, if I have these two directed graphs, can you write code to like demonstrate whether one is a transformation of the other and, and like write what the transformation is? And you're like, I don't know. It's more like, hey, if I have a file that's got this stuff in it, can you write code to reliably, under all circumstances, uh, replace these kinds of things with these kinds of things after building a lookup table. So you're like, is that software? That's absolutely software. Is that? Yeah, is it? Right, it is. Yes! You're like, I would fire up Django. <laughs> um, so it's not algorithmically sophisticated. So, so, and then there's a bunch of people who are super interesting to us who are in the middle, who have like, 
don't have fantastic system skills, like maybe you don't have great OS internals or don't have good networking skills, but have pretty good troubleshooting skills, some kind of interesting systems experience, and really, really good, but not quite Google good software engineering skills. And you're like, where do those people go at Google? Those people come to site reliability engineering because we're like, that's fantastic. You are somewhere in the middle of these two job families, and we can totally give you interesting stuff to do. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, we do, we, we definitely hire people without stellar software skills into SRE, but they have to have, like, most of the people that uh, work in SRE as systems engineers have had a job title as software engineer at some point in their career, because in, like, out in the industry, they're like, I wrote 10,000 lines of Python here and there, so I was a software engineer, and at Google, they're like, maybe, maybe, how about the systems thing? That'll be, yeah. Does that answer the question? Awesome, other, yes? No, so practically speaking right now, like, uh, like so I think mo where most people are right now is, like, tr strive for homogeneity of your hosts. Like, that came up multiple times today. It's like, it's just strive for homogeneity of your hosts. Develop a, uh, you know, deploy, install configuration system that mostly prevents you from having to SSH to hosts except for under rare circumstances. That's where we are right now. Where we need to get to is stop worrying about machines and start thinking about jobs. Right? Like the question isn't like what like the question isn't what machine do you have? The question is like what is somebody trying to do? The problem is that I think we've picked a little bit the wrong abstractions. Like we're still stuck on a VM, a machine, an operating system. And like, well, actually I didn't want user. I didn't want Etsy. What I wanted to do was serve this web page. That's what I wanted to do. And I understand that you gave me Etsy and you gave me user and you gave me sockets and like, I have all that. Here I am, I have kernel, I have MMAT, this is great. But what I actually just wanted to do was serve this set of content. What I actually wanted to do was provide low latency access to this distributed hash table. And I, I mean, if you need to run a whole operating system just for me to do that, I guess you could do that. So that's where I think we need to get to. So um, like, I think that the model of, um, and as badly implemented as it was in the beginning and the pricing snafus and some of the reliability challenges, I think App Engine is a more appealing long-term style of abstraction than most of what uh, people have been doing now. And I think, like, I don't, I don't have any, I don't have any uh, you know, illusions that everybody's gonna go code everything on App Engine now, but I think that that kind of approach, just to use that as an example of saying, like, I, I don't know how many machines there it's running on. What I know is I have a distributed data set and I serve queries about it, and I do it and it scales with the number of users using it and it's not my problem. That's where I think we need to be. And as an infrastructure engineer, like what you need to understand is how are the tasks distributed onto hosts, right? Which are the, like, and you might find a host that's a problem or find a hotspot in the network, but then like now you're down in the internals and it's actually an incident rather than, you know, a particular, uh, problem, but so I guess I'm trying to like yes, you're right. Right now, like state of the art where we are right now for most people is automate as much of it as you can with configuration management, and you still occasionally think about machines. So on the scale of like zero to five, we're at like 0.75. So that's fine. But like we'll get to we'll we'll keep moving down that road. Other stuff. Awesome. Thank you all for your time. <laughs>